the camera's on, we can see you sleeping, eating, picking your nose, whatever. So you might want to consider that. Um, okay, moving right along, our next speaker is Dr. Carrie Schleyer. Uh, she has she received her PhD from the University of New Mexico. She's currently the curator of archaeology at the Maxwell Museum of Anthropology, as well as an assistant professor of anthropology at the University of New Mex Mexico. This is a position she just started this summer, I believe. And prior to that, she was the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center um, lab manager. And I will turn my camera on. And not only that, but she is the author of this award-winning book. Buy it. It's expensive, but it's worth it. <laughs> um, having said that, um, her uh, talk today is on, not surprisingly, pottery production, learning, and social networks at the San Marcos Pueblo in New Mexico. Take it away, Carrie. Thank you, Linda. Let me share my screen. Linda's been asking me to give this talk for a while now, so By the um, way, I'll in, finally be able to do that. In light of full disclosure, Carrie and I have known each other for just a few years. <laughs> And she has also been vice president of the Hisatsanan chapter. I believe you still are, aren't you? I am. I'm sort of hanging out till the end of the year because as long as we're, you know, doing everything socially distant, I can still do those things from Albuquerque, even though I'm no longer in Cortez. Great. So we're going to miss you. Great. <laughs> well, you know, hopefully I can continue to stay involved with, with Cass. Well, thank you for, for inviting me to speak today on, on this topic, Linda. I'm excited. I always love to talk about pottery um, and San Marcos. We're going back to sort of the same area of the world where Caitlin spoke about a little bit ago. And I'm really excited to talk to you about how we can use pottery as a line of evidence to really understand life in the past a little bit better. So to get into that, we first have to think about how pottery has been used by archaeologists to better understand life. The very early work with pottery was focused on types and typically based on mostly on pottery designs. Um, and the, the, the earliest work that uh, is important for our discussion today was A.V. Kidder's work in the early, early 1900s, where he used pottery and architectural styles to define archaeological cultural areas. It wasn't long after that that archaeologists began to realize how complex uh, a medium like pottery is and really an art form and a technology. And as they began watching Pueblo potters, for example, here's San Alfonso Pueblo potter Maria Martinez making a vessel, um, archaeologists began to see how complex the process of pottery making is and therefore all of the different lines of evidence that are sort of included in looking at pots that were made by Pueblo people. Anna Shepard continued this trend in the middle 1900s by looking at the materials that pots were made of and getting just closer um, than just looking at designs. And what she did was she began looking at those raw materials. Here is an example of temper, which is the material that potters add to their clay to improve the workability of the clay or the strength or the functionality of the pot. And she identified that, wow, you could use temper, especially in a geologically varied area like the Rio Grande region of New Mexico. You could use that to identify where pottery was being made. And because you could identify where it was being made, you could then identify when you found pots in other areas that were made of non-local materials that they were traded into that area. So this um, chart or this map that I'm showing you here has little pie charts over each area of the Rio Grande that Anna Shepard researched. And what you'll see in each one of these little pie charts is they're showing the percentage of particular types of tempered pottery that she found in those locations. But what you, what's really important and what I've highlighted here is that 
one type of temper, uh, andesite rock, a volcanic rock called andesite, was only used by potters in, in the Galisteo Basin. Um, and yet, it was pottery with that temper were found all throughout the northern Rio Grande. I'm going to highlight, if I can, a couple of locations. For example, the Salinas Pueblos down near Socorro, New Mexico. Most of their pottery was coming from this area of the Rio Grande, the Galisteo area of the Rio Grande. So this was very exciting at the time because at the time archeologists really felt that in the past every Pueblo potter, um, every Pueblo family had a potter that made all their own goods. And so this showed that there was much more complexity to trade and exchange happening in the past. So the reason that we can, the reason archeologists are really interested in looking at things like pottery is that we want to better understand what was going on in these communities in the past. So that involves the concept of social networks. Social networks allow us to identify the connections at multiple levels, even at the level of the individual and also at the level of the community. At the level of the individual, we can look at learning to see that certain uh, techniques that were learned behavior are reflecting how closely connected people are within a particular village. And then we can also look at bigger patterns like distribution and exchange when we see things that are of non-local materials uh, at places where they must have been traded to um, have gotten to that particular location. And this works because people participate in communities of practice. Basically, the concept of communities of practice is that participants are going to share an understanding about what they're doing and what that means in their lives and for their communities. In our talk today, this is focused on the social network in which potters learn to make pottery. So the community of practice is really that group of people that you are interacting with closely enough to learn how to make pottery in a particular way. Pottery is so important for, um, for us to be able to use this technique of uh, this sort of theoretical perspective because there's tons of options that are available to potters that work just as well as other options. So you could add different types of materials, you could form things in different ways, you could use different designs, and you would still have a pot, or there's lots of variabilities that would result in a pot that works fine for what you need it to work for. So we can see how learning is encoded by looking at the choices that potters are making. So today we're gonna to talk about some of my research at San Marcos Pueblo. And I looked at about 15 different steps in the production process of pottery. We're not gonna talk about all those today because that would take way more than my 15, 20 minutes that I'm allotted. Um, but I've picked out three that I think are the most interesting and most uh, um, illustrative of the patterns that I saw at, in the pottery from San Marcos Pueblo. The first one of those is the clay and temper and which ones were selected and how those were processed. The second choice is the paint materials and how that is made into a recipe, a particular recipe. And then the third is the designs and decorative attributes that are used by potters. So my case study today is from San Marcos Pueblo. San Marcos, and, and you already heard a little bit about this from Caitlin in her talk earlier. San Marcos is located just on the outskirts of the Galisteo Basin, just south of Santa Fe, New Mexico. Now, San Marcos is um, sort of considered one of the Galisteo Basin towns. You see a number of additional uh, communities uh, as part of the Galisteo Basin Pueblos that are shown on the map here. San Marcos was an important place, one, because of its location close by to the Cerrillos Hills, where we know that they got turquoise as well as lead, and lead that was used to make pottery. The, the paint that we see on the pots at San Marcos is a lead glaze that is made using galena from the galena, which is a lead sulfide rock coming out of the Cerrillos Hills. Now, San Marcos, people lived in this community from around um, 1380, 1300 until the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. Um, 
In the 1630s, uh, 1638, I believe there was a Spanish mission established at San Marcos in the community. So this period of time that we're looking at with work um, in this, this really large village or town is from way before Spanish contact in the 1300s through colonization. And it allows us to look at the changes that happened in the lives of Pueblo people living at San Marcos through this really important period in, in Pueblo history. San Marcos itself um, is uh, at the peak of its occupation. It probably had about 2,500 people living there. There were 40, um, approximately 40 different room blocks centered around plazas and a couple of a number of kivas um, that were present um, in, in the community. The other wonderful thing about uh, San Marcos is that all of the northern Rio Grande glazeware pottery types were locally manufactured at the site. So that gives us an option, and Caitlin talked about this a little bit earlier, is that having particular pottery types found that we've identified through previous archaeological work in the region and have been able to associate types with calendar dates. So uh, glaze A is the earliest, going all the way through glaze F, um, which is, is the type that we see that is present after Spanish, um, Spanish contact in, in the community. So this is great for looking at changes that happen through time at San Marcos because we can look at the variation we see in each of these pottery types across the occupation of, of the village. So um, our project at San Marcos, which began along about more than 20 years ago, um, the project director for the project was um, Dr. Ann Romanofsky, who is a, a retired professor from the University of New Mexico. Um, and she started this project with a number of goals. One of them was to look at changes that occurred over uh, the course of um, the occupation of the site. What happens to the community? Uh, what, what sort of um, changes come up with Spanish contact and colonization? How do the Pueblo people react and are, how are they impacted by um, Spanish colonists and um, missionaries living in their community with them? So one of the reason, one of the, the methods that she developed was to do a complete surface survey and sampling of the surface of the site. Part of the goal of the work being primarily not focused on excavation was because of concerns with descendant community members. Um, San Marcos is primarily connected to Cochiti and Santa Domingo. And in conversations that, that Dr. Romanofsky had with both those communities, they really um, were more uh, interested in having non-destructive work done at the site than having excavation done. So most of the project involved surface work. Now, for me, that worked out great because we were able to collect over 660,000 um, 60, pottery sherds from this surface work at San Marcos. And in the sample that I looked at for my dissertation research, I looked at around 9,000 of the rim sherds from the site. These are some examples of those here. Um, now, the great thing about the shirt sample is that many of them were kind of small. I could look at uh, things that are technological very easily on this shirt sample. Um, and I could always tell if it was made locally at San Marcos because I could look at that tempering material, the particular type of temper that had already been identified to be a production material only used by potters at San Marcos. So that gave me a great opportunity to use this surface shirt sample to look at questions of technological changes over the occupation of the site. But I also wanted to look at design. I was very interested in looking at design and how designs were used by potters at San Marcos. But unfortunately, um, 
we found, you know, obviously on the surface, there weren't any whole pots that we identified. So what I did instead was I used museum collections from previous projects of work at San Marcos and other sites across the region to look at the pottery um, designs that were utilized by potters in the Rio Grande. What you'll notice on this map is showing some of the sites that I sampled whole vessels from at about six different museums across um, the United States, including the American Museum of Natural History, where the Nels Nelson collections are, which a lot of these whole vessel photos that I'm showing um, come from the Nels Nelson collection. There are also some um, at other museums like the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Fe. So San Marcos, which is here in the center, the site number for San Marcos is LA-98. Um, that's where about half of my whole vessels came from. So, and then the rest of the whole vessels came from a number of different sites across the region. So this is a little bit of a different sample than the shirt sample. The shirt sample, I could look at each one, I could look under a microscope and identify that it was locally made. So I know when I talk about that shirt sample that I'm definitely talking about what potters at San Marcos were doing. And in evaluating the shirt sample, I found that of, of the glaze wares, almost 90% of the glaze wares that we found at San Marcos were made locally. So that was great. And that also tells me when I look at these whole pots, of course, the ones that were found at other sites, and many of them are complete like this one, so I couldn't look at the temper at all to identify production. But I do have about half my sample being made at San Marcos, or I'm sorry, being found at San Marcos. And because the shirt sample was so dominated by local production, I'm assuming that most of those whole pots were also made by potters at San Marcos. So this gives me a little bit of a different data set where I can compare designs on pots at San Marcos and um, ideally or um, assuming that they were made by potters there to designs used on pots across the whole uh, northern Rio Grande region to get an idea of variability of designs over time in the region. Okay, so we're going to look at our three different variables. The first one we're going to look at is the material selection and processing. Um, and how I did that was this very intensive, uh, sort of like a survey, like what Caitlin was describing where they surveyed whole areas. Well, instead of surveying the landscape, I surveyed these little thin slices of pottery under the microscope and identified what types of rocks were present and what types of rocks had been used for tempering material. And then I needed to look at, because at San Marcos, there's just one type of rock that potters were using. It's, it's, um, um, it's an augite monzonite, not that you need to know that level of detail, but this augite monzonite, um, I, could, I wanted to look at if there were any changes over time in how that rock was processed, right? It was the same temper that potters used for those you know, 400 years but did they change how they processed that temper over time, especially with say really dramatic things in their events that have happened in the lives of potters like Spanish, a Spanish mission being established and colonization happening. So I did that and I looked at 40,000 little tiny grains of rock and uh, what I found was, and with the idea that if there were changes in processing, you might have greater amounts of grinding or greater or lesser amounts of grinding of those samples and processing of those materials. And that would give you greater or changes in the shape of those little grains, the sphericity, how rounded they were, and also the angularity, how jagged the edges are of the little grains. So I looked at about, um, I'm sorry, 20,000 points in 121 sherds from San Marcos. And then I did a statistical technique called the Shannon Diversity Index to look at the range of variation present in the processing of these materials. And what you'll see here is, and I don't know if I can move this around. This is the, oh yeah, okay, I'm gonna move this over here in case that's covering um, your screen. We're looking at the changes that happen over time by looking at the changes in each glaze type. And you'll see that it looks like pretty much a flat line, 
that tells us that there's not a difference in the range of variation in how potters are processing things through time. I had expected that perhaps things would become less variable or more variable um, in the, the time after Spanish contact, which would have been glaze E and or glaze F periods of, of production. And I did not see that. I saw incredible stability, which tells us that the potters were able to continue their traditions of pottery making, even with these incursions of, of colonial uh, Spaniards coming into the community. Okay, so that's one of our attributes. Now let's look at the next attribute, which is glaze paint composition. So uh, the glaze paint, which was made from lead that came from the Cerrillos Hills, just really close by San Marcos, just adjacent to San Marcos. And so what I did to look at the glaze paint composition was I did electron microprobe analysis to get at the chemical composition and basically figure out what the recipe was of this glaze painted pottery. And what I found was, uh, and I was very distressed about this when I went to talk to, to my, my, my dissertation advisor and I said, I said, what, what's happening? It's very, it's, there's very little variation through time in the glaze paint composition. And so we found almost no changes in glaze paint composition over time. So that was a little distressing for your dissertation where you're looking for some patterns that you'd like to talk about. And so I went to a number of my colleagues who were also working on research on glaze paint composition on different areas of the northern Rio, of the Rio Grande region, um, Deb Huntley and Cynthia Herhan. And so then we compared our, our data. So what this is showing is this graph is a principal component analysis, which is basically mapping that recipe that I got from using doing electron microprobe analysis uh, to get the composition of the paint. And what you're seeing in red is my San Marcos sherds. And you'll see it's a very tight cluster, which says it's a, which tells us it's a pretty um, standardized recipe of glaze paint. And you'll notice that the sherds that are in black here, which come from a site, two sites, sorry, I'm trying to get this to move, two sites now down near Socorro, um, Abo and Korai, um, where Deb Huntley and Cynthia Herhan were working at the time. And you'll notice that the recipe on the sherds there, the glaze paint uh, recipe was much more variable. There's a much wider range of um, paints being paint recipes being used by potters in these other these other two sites. But if you go way back and you think about it, okay, now my San Marcos sherds, I already figured out that they were all locally made at San Marcos by looking at the temper that was used by potters um, in those pots. I knew that those were all locally made, but uh, the research that Deb and Cynthia um, were doing at Abo and Quarai, they um, were looking at all the pottery that was found at the site, not just locally made pottery. So now the next slide I'm gonna show you is going to be where we actually look at where the sherds were made, where those pots were made, not just where they were recovered archeologically. Okay, so on this slide, all the little black circles came from Abo and Korai, but we didn't know if they were made at Abo and Korai. Okay. okay. Is that going? Sorry. Okay. So what you'll see here is a little bit of a different pattern. Um, I've made San Marcos here in black to go on so that you can it's kind of on the bottom of the of the, the graph just so that you can see our standardized recipe that we had at San Marcos. But then you're going to look at all of these other areas of production. There are um, sherds from Tonke Pueblo that were that are is right here just a little bit um, the clo one of the closer sites to San Marcos. There's also sherds that are vessels that were made at Abo and Quarai. There are vessels that were made at other sites within the Galisteo Basin, um, like some of those other sites that Caitlin was talking about, like I think Pueblo Blanco she was looking at, which would be one of these sites. And then there are sites uh, along the Rio Grande where they're using basalt temper. 
Now, the really interesting thing is you'll see that a lot of these one, a lot of these different communities seem to be using that same San Marcos recipe. So potters at the site of Tonke, potters at the site of Abo, and also at Quarai were using the same recipe as potters at San Marcos. Now, the interesting thing is, is that you'll notice that potters um, that were located along um, the Rio Grande using basalt tempers, and even potters making pots in the Galisteo Basin just adjacent to San Marcos are not using the same recipe. So this was really fascinating to us. Um, and so we, what we're, how we're interpreting this is that there are learning networks for how to make your glaze paint that are shared within people at these communities, San Marcos, Tonke, Abo, and Quarai, but are not necessarily shared with folks in other communities, even if those communities are closer than, say, Abo and Quarai are to San Marcos. So this was really fascinating because it gets at that question of learning. It tells us that we have social connections where you have learned how to make a glaze because it's a pretty complex technology. You can't just grind something up and then you get that same recipe. You actually have to do some a number of steps in the process. And so this complex technology, people are talking about how to do that. And they're talking about that with residents of these other big sites like Tonke, but not necessarily with everyone that's close by. So this tells us that we have specific social networks that are close with some individuals and some communities that aren't necessarily just based on closeness and proximity. So this was a pretty exciting result for this glaze paint recipe. Then the, the third attribute I want us to talk about today is the designs and decorative attributes. Now, remember, we looked at the design and decorative attributes on about 140 whole vessels that were about half of those were made at San Marcos and the other half were made across the whole region. So I looked at um, those 140 vessels and on those vessels identified about 500 different elements and motifs. Then I did the same statistical technique that we did with our temper processing, the Shannon Diversity Index, and looked at how those designs changed or varied over time, and how much variability there was in the design um, designs chosen to be used by potters in any one particular time. And what you'll notice here is that from glaze A to glaze E time periods, we have incredible stability, very little variation. Um, you know, that same level of variation is, is occurring across the entire time period. And then we get a decrease in the amount of variability for glaze F. Now, of course, if you remember what happens in the glaze F period, well, that's after Spanish contact and after we have the establishment of a mission and colonization in the, in the community. So what we see here is that the design is the only thing we've seen thus far that varied with Spanish contact. This is pretty interesting because that tells us that those technological elements that we saw in the temper and the glaze, those ones are very stable. Those ones don't change even with Spanish colonization. So potters are able to maintain those traditions and those learning traditions through Spanish uh, colonization um, in, the, in both the site and the region. But what does happen is something real visual like designs painted on pots do change. So we see this decrease in designs that might be reflective of the impact that Spanish are having based on colonization. And we're seeing that only in this one attribute. So can you imagine if we hadn't been looking at all of the different attributes of the pots, even if you may think it's a, it's a lot, it's a lot of looking at all these little detailed attributes, but we can see different elements of daily life and of the production process by looking at all of the attributes. So this, re this is just a great example of, um, you know, that we're seeing how learning works in uh, the site of San Marcos by looking at these different elements of production. We see incredible stability in um, most elements of production, especially the materials and recipes used for the 
paste or the temper and the paint. But then we're seeing a change in how designs are used, especially with colonization and Spanish contact. So pottery really gives us this rich view of what lives were like uh, for some of the members of this community. Um, and I like to show this example of, of Maria Martinez and some of her sisters demonstrating how to make pottery in the, the early 1900s at the, in the Palace of the Governors in Santa Fe, because it really shows us that it's all about those connections and being able to see by looking at the different elements of pottery production, how learning is maintained or how it may be changed or disrupted by things like colonization in certain elements of pottery production. So th this is my plug for all of you that might look at a pot shirt on the ground and be like, oh, well, that's that's just a nice little, uh, it's got a pretty decoration. But we can learn so much by looking at all those little pot shirts and getting a better understanding of what life was like in the past by really intensively looking at this particular type of material culture. And if you're interested in learning more about San Marcos, I, as Linda's already uh, done, nicely done a little plug for me, um, this book that I edited with uh, Ann Romanofsky, who was the project director for the San Marcos Project, um, and myself, it, it came out in 2017, and it has great color pictures of pottery in it as well. So um, we, I'd recommend you go check that out and see, see, learn a little bit more about this really important place in, in Pueblo history. Okay, I'd also like to say thank you to um, my funders, the National Science Foundation funded part of this research, as well as a number of funding agencies at the University of New Mexico. Um, I will now stop sharing my screen so that I can see if there's any questions in um, the chat box. Let's come back to here. Okay, if anybody has questions for Carrie, please enter them in the chat box. There is something. Where oh, you can uh, you can find the book. Uh, you know, they sell it in a number of places. I've I've seen it at the at a number of the national parks, like Pecos uh, has it for sale, um, as well as Amazon. You know, you can get you can get most things on Amazon. It's uh, published by UNM Press, so you can also if you go to the UNM Press website, I think you could also order it online there. Any other questions? Now's your chance. <laughs> Carrie, thank you so much. I'm so glad I finally was able to snare you into this. <laughs> well, thank you. And I, you know, you, you asked me to talk about pottery and I, I liked, I do love to talk about pottery. So I talk appreciate that opportunity. <laughs> Anytime. Um, if there are no other questions, wait, let me see, is this a new question? Uh, no, this is Katie's old question. Okay, thank you again so much, Carrie, and good luck with your new positions. And um, hopefully, we will see you again. Actually, Great. face to face. I really want to see you face to face. <laughs> well, thank you. For the virtual stuff is all good, but I miss seeing my friends up close and personal. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, thanks again, and um, I think we have a bunch of thank yous and loving this talk, which is all good. All right, with that, um, let's move.